Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'll be your host, and this podcast exists to help you improve your communication skills, whether you communicate one-on-one to a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen. We know that when we improve our communication skills as leaders, it exponentially changes everything. It improves our relationships, it improves our leadership skills, and it improves our business skills. So let's get ready to dive into this next episode. Well, how would you like to master the art of giving and receiving feedback? Do you give feedback regularly? Are you in a position right now where feedback is given to you from your boss or your supervisor or the leadership above you? Do you tense up the moment that somebody has some feedback for you? Do you shy away from it? Do you hide away from it? Do you, is it hard for you to give honest feedback? Well, today we have the amazing opportunity to have an incredible conversation and discussion with Dr. Mary Ritz on the Speak With People podcast. And we're going to talk about this vital skill. We're going to talk about probably so much more, but we're going to dive into all of that. She is the founder and owner of Almenta International LLC. She's an expert international facilitator, trainer, speaker, communicator, She's got an incredible story, and I can't wait to dive into it more. Dr. Ritz, thank you so much for being on the Speak With People podcast. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for the opportunity. Great to be connected with you and looking forward to a great conversation. Absolutely. And I love that we had a mutual friend who connected us, Dustin Portillo, and I love that this came about from him. Yes, yes. Great guy. Great guy. I was also connected um, uh, by other people to Dustin. We did a collaboration together. He did fabulous work on that project. And here we are. Here we are. It's all about networking and just connecting one another. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, our last names are pretty similar. Uh, Many folks have confused my name over the years for Ritz. I have. I just have an A in there. R A I T Z. So, <laughs> I thought so. You know, like when 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 I was introduced to you, I said, "What is this a joke or what <laughs> happened? Are we, are we cousins? What what is it?" You know. So yeah, very very interesting. Yeah, I love it. Well, before we yeah. jump into some of these questions and interview, I'd love for you to just give our listeners a little bit more of your background, who you are, what you do, what's got you to the place you are in now. Sure. Sure. Um, Thanks a lot again for that great question. Um, I I am based in Atlanta, Georgia, but I do not sound anything like a Georgian. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. Um, That's the southern part of of Africa, just above South Africa, if if, if we can picture that Mm. for our audience. Um, Grew up in in a great family. Um, Mom and dad really fostered a learning culture in our family. Mm. Uh, you had to get that degree. You had to get another second degree if you could. Uh, this was just your way out um, to look for greener pastures, so to speak. So as a little girl, I've told this story many times, but I'm sure I can share it here too. As a little girl, I would come from school, um, put my book back down, and um, my hobby or my entertainment was to be a little teacher, an imaginary teacher. So I'd sit under the avocado pear tree and teach the whole afternoon to this imaginary class. My whole idea, I remember, was to encourage this imaginary class to advance themselves, to empower themselves, just Mm -hmm. like my teacher during the morning had impacted me, had also encouraged me to learn my mathematics, to learn my English language so that I could be a nurse, I could be a doctor, I could actually be empowered to do whatever I wanted to do. So that was a strong message. I was quite passionate about it that my my siblings then nicknamed me the teacher. (laughs) Fast forward around the age of 15 when your parents start to send you off maybe to buy groceries or to pick bread or milk. Uh, I would come back home and and then say to my older siblings, what's going on? I mean, we purchase things, they should be nice to us. Mm. You know, I was treated very badly. At 15, I wasn't so intelligent enough or smart enough to know what I was questioning was customer service. 
So the background was really around education. And then I became a little teacher with an imaginary class. At the age of 15, then my sister would say, maybe you should be a consultant. I did not understand all that language. I was too young to right. understand. But fast forward, I then went to, and I did my master's. Uh, I did a an, an marketing degree initially uh, in South Africa. And then I did uh, an MBA at High Point University. My concentration was international business. And then after that, I moved to South Africa and I did a PhD academically. Mm. I have worked in several um, op corporations, American Express, Verizon Wireless, Standard Bank of South Africa, Woolies in South, in, in South Africa. So I've been different places, but I realized that really entrepreneurship was calling my name. Mm. I wasn't very good, Jason, in taking instructions and putting being put in a pigeonhole. Uh, you're a product manager and that's what you do. I would just wanted to play in different spaces. I wanted to be able to yep. impact and add value in different ways. So in 2008, that's when I jumped ship from the corporate and I started Aumenta International, which is a training and developing organization that focuses on three main areas, customer centricity, leadership um, development, and team development. Mm. And you know, I, I can I can just stop there just for further questions or clarifying questions if you have any, uh, Jason. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. So you're able to uh, use, I, I, thank you for taking us a little deeper into your childhood because it's always fun to hear some backstory and it's always interesting how they match up uh, to, you know, where, where you get to, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, yeah. so it's neat to see what you do now. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. It, it, it's very neat. It's, it's, it, for me, it's a calling. It called me before I knew it because that's what I do today. I, I teach, I empower, I equip, I encourage, I help leaders and team members and organizations transform and change to be the yep. best that they can be. Wow. That's my life. That's what I'm passionate about. Wow. Uh, so it's a calling for me. Yeah. Yes. I love that. So when you work with a company, do, is it typically over the course of a, you know, a set time? Is it you come in and do training or they send them to you? What's kind of the norm there? Oh, it, it, it varies. Yeah. I, I really believe in customization, mm. not one size fits all. So I understand, I take the time to discover and understand what an organization needs. So sometimes the interventions or the projects are one day, two days, sometimes three months to a year. So depending on how much they want to go into their solutions, that's what I make available. Um, and when I get engaged in a project, it's normally at the organization. Right. I go and I integrate within the organization, so to speak. Other trainings can happen at a conference. I mean, at a conference center and all speaking engagements, depending on where the conference is. Coaching can happen online. It does not yep. always have to happen um, in person. So it's a variety of platforms yeah. that I, 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 I incorporate in my work. And speaking of what you did, <clears throat> you talked about earlier with, you know, your project manager, or your one specific job. I bet what you do now, you know, keeps you interested because it hits on the different, different areas. <laughs> it, it does, Jason, it does. Um, especially with this background that I have in customer centricity. Mm. The, the assumption is that you're, you're only focusing on the customer, which is true, yes. So everything that you do is driven by your customer. Right. But in the customer centricity world, you're really looking at the whole entire system of an organization. Therefore, that's why it's easy for me to jump in and talk about leadership. It's easy for me to come and talk about team development. Like now we're talking about giving feedback because customer centricity integrates all these business aspects that are just not one size fits all. So yes, we talk about the customer, but what are we doing underlying across and vertically so that we can service the customer? So it's not just about customer service. 
It's about innovation. It's about product innovation. It's about technology. Mm. And all those things I dive into. And I do coaching, training, consulting, um, building strategy. So it's a variety of things that really keeps me um, interested and, and, and it keeps me on my toes, to be honest. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to stay relevant. To stay yes. relevant. Yes. I, I like to ask this question to people in, in your field. Do you find that uh, it's typically Fortune 500 companies who invest the most in training and development? Do you, you know, your, sm your smaller uh, mom and pop companies or small businesses, you know, the, are they investing at all in training and development? What, what have you found with your experience? Typically, it, it, is, it has now changed. Mm. Well, typically, it was your corporate, all right? So it's, it was your corporate. But the opportunities right now are the the smaller organization, the mom and pop um, sort of setups, so to speak, your small um, businesses. That's where the opportunity is. And there is now an appetite to understand how to do business. Uh, if I can say more properly, more uh, appropriately so that they can put their strategies in place. Mm -hmm. the, the market is demanding that. Wow. If we want to stay relevant and if we want to stay close to our customers, we can't continue to operate at a smaller scale. Yes, you can do that, but your thinking and your approach should be bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. So when it comes to leaders in the workplace, uh, talk a little bit about how important it is for leaders to focus on, learn the critical skill, uh, you know, of uh, receiving and or delivering feedback, you know, to, especially on a team level. How, how important it is that for, you know, leaders to be able to have that skill? I would say crucial. Mm. It's, 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 it's crucial. It uh, receiving and giving feedback formulate influence how we solve our challenges. Yes. They, it influences how we foster creativity and innovation. Wow. It helps you as the leader to understand your blind spots and, um, your weaknesses and your strengths so that you can, you can, you can build from and gives you the opportunity to build on as well. So it's something that we cannot shy away from. I know a lot of people feel like, oh gosh, feedback is being criticized. It's not. Uh, I've heard somebody say feedback is a gift. Mm. It is a gift because it's an opportunity for you as a leader to move your organization forward in terms of understanding what needs to change that's feedback right, right. At, a, at, a, at an organizational level but also understanding what needs to happen in your team because we work through teams right. if we shy away from feedback then we're paralyzing and penalizing employee engagement innovation and creativity yeah it, it's packed it's packed not only are we even looking at the team think about it we want to be able to even receive and give feedback from the stakeholders around us, the other partners that we do business with, our customers as well. So that's another angle that also can be talked to besides or in addition to looking at it from internal. Only. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Was there a moment in your, uh, your leadership or your your professional journey where, you know, it just sticks out as one of those first moments that you received some of that feedback and maybe you didn't respond to it all that well, or, or maybe you did. Is there a story that kind of sticks out to one of those, those moments for you? Oh, I can tell you many stories. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I talk about it and I teach on it does not mean I've not had my own. I think it's a human to want to receive. Yeah. We tend to just walk side. Yeah. Bringing our parents, 
you know, when we, then when we did not do that. So I think of wanting, thinking we are great mm. human beings that are really, we are. So having said example of as uh, I was working at a I had not own assertiveness and feedback forming very well. All I accept that I did not have the effectiveness to give the feedback. Number one, right? The leader as well need the opportunity to. It was very one-sided. It mm. was their views on me. All right, and I accepted it. And all I was doing was signing this underperforming document, and I did not know that I was signing myself out of a job. Oof. Fortunately enough, before that happened, then somebody, another leader who was more qualified, then adopted me, put me in their team. Very different experience. In this case, I was now written up for poor performance. I was not even aware of it because it was never a two-way conversation. Mm. I was brought now with a second leader who now could give effective feedback and impactful feedback sat down with me, really made me understand what the process was. Mm. I shared my opinions. I started learning on how to receive and also give feedback. Wow. And before we know it, at the end of that period, six months, I was one of the top performers <laughs> because feedback was now targeted. I was really being explained, things were being explained to me that were clear where I was going wrong and where I needed to change. So that's one area that I was in a position where I was receiving feedback, but I was also not giving feedback myself. Mm. And because of that, I was almost losing a job. Wow. Wow. What, what do you think holds back leaders from uh, receiving feedback in a healthy way? Because sometimes they want to put up, you know, a defense system. They want to, you know, they want to argue about it and fight. And so, you know, what is it, do you think, inside of us leaders that, you know, we, we do want to, you know, put up that wall defense right away when it comes to some of that feedback? M many, many reasons come to mind, Jason. One of them is we believe that feedback is criticism mm. and we do not want to be criticized. Yeah. So I can understand and empathize because sometimes when feedback is being given, it's not being given in the kindest way. Mm. All right. So therefore we become defensive. That's number one. So we receive feedback or we perceive feedback as something that is criticizing us. That's number one. Number two, the leader normally now starts to believe that they know it all. They are talented. They they cannot go wrong. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes the ego gets in the way. Oof, yeah. And because you have the position, you have the title, that you've got the experience, you believe you've got it all. So that tends to get into the way, our ego. Yeah. Then the next thing that I would like to believe is because, number three, is the culture has not cultivated mm. a culture of feedback. So nobody really knows how to do it. We don't really tell people how beneficial it is. We believe that feedback is one way only to the employees, but we actually don't realize and we've not cultivated it. We also have not cultivated the fact that we can give feedback, even if it's not the most famous feedback, it's okay, we don't penalize people. So the whole idea is that now there's a 
passive aggressiveness, there's an aggressiveness in it and people are afraid to give feedback. Mm. And even the, you know, like the, the, the leader himself or herself is also afraid that if they feel like they're being criticized, their job is also in jeopardy. Right. So the, those are the three things that I could I could share. And, you know, Jason, we can sit here and just unpack that. You've just <laughs> asked a loaded question. But those three, I think, are some of the main reasons why leaders shy away from feedback. For sure. Oh, I love those. And I love that you hit on the culture and it just speaks to how important it is, especially if you're in a position uh, to influence the overall culture, you know, to bring in that, uh, the health to it and the ability to, you know, share openly that way. I mean, it's, it's just powerful. If people don't have to, you know, get into like defense mode when feedback's happening, you know, great things are ahead. Yes. Yes, very true. And if I can add, like, like to that, in terms of that culture, because then we can ask, how do we build the culture? Then we train on giving each other the feedback. Let's train each other. All right. How do we actually package how we give feedback? Um, do we bring in a trainer? Do we, you know, what books are we reading around that? Um, the way that I give Jason feedback, could it differ from the way that I give Robert feedback? Mm. So understanding all those nuances. And also as part of our vision, as our mission, you know, are we leading by example and receiving the feedback and leaving it and and, 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 and asking for it? You know, yes. how often do you ask for feedback? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm, 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 I'm speaking ahead of ourselves, Jason. I'll stop there for now. I love that. No, that's that's just a giant question and so important. Mm -hmm. And so what what uh, walk us through how how often do you think leaders should ask for feedback? And, you know, what are the appropriate and, you know, uh, correct ways to do that? I think it should be consistent. Mm. Um, as part of the organizational culture that is being intentionally developed around our feedback. Yeah. We, we want to come up with some agreements. You know, how often do we do it? Um you know, do we do it every one-on-ones? Mm -hmm. um, do we do it every quarter? Do we do it every week? What are the, but it must be consistent. It cannot right. be this once a year, uh, once in a blue moon, <laughs> sort <laughs> of. It has to be habitual. Uh, so every interaction can be a place where you can ask for feedback. Like even after this conversation, you know, give me feedback and I give you feedback at the end of it. It right. does not always have to be that formal that we sit down on it. So every time we're interacting, we have a meeting, one-on-one -on -one meetings, team meetings, that's an opportunity that we can collect feedback, right? Um, during our performance appraisals, that's an opportunity for us to do that. But also we can be very intentional throughout and do surveys if you want to do that, you know, and, and just put that in focus groups. We can do that. So yeah. how many feedback sessions can we have throughout the year? So the consistency of, 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 of doing that is very, very important. How many you have, it depends on how you want to design it. I will yes. not say do it every week, do it every month. No, yes. but just do it consistently. I love that. How important it is for the boss or the team leader to also model it? Uh, and do you find that, you know, happens pretty frequently in companies or is that kind of a rarity where the person in charge opens them up themselves up for feedback? I've seen it in different ways. Mm. Uh, so the modeling of it is, is, is quite challenging for a lot of people because speaking something and giving feedback to other people comes easier to most people. But it's now the receiving of the feedback that we don't right. want. Again, our fears, our egos, I know, right, I'm the leader. Th that works differently for some people. Right. And that takes a lot of emotional intelligence. Understanding your weaknesses, understanding your fears. Why are you so afraid of receiving feedback. What happened? What 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 put you in that position? Mm. How then do you face that to overcome that? 
So that emotional intelligence, that self-awareness, to actually look at yourself in the mirror and to say, yes, I'm good at giving feedback, but I'm not so good at receiving it. What's getting into my way and what do I need to work on? You realize that once you do that self-awareness work, self-management work, then you can start to open up to receiving feedback Wow. and accepting it for what it is, right? Also not reacting wow. to the feedback is important. Yeah. I've been given feedback by Jason Maybe it's not settling or resonating well with me. By why, why is that? Then I don't react to it, but I sit with it. I dwell in, in, in it. That's what I call it. I dwell yep. in it. I'm trying to process it and then I react to it. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Wow. That's so good. And imagine just if, you know, the team had that as a model, mm -hmm. how much further they would get because, you know, Honesty and the ability to share would just be, <laughs> would be there. People don't have to worry about, you know, being attacked or all of their mistakes brought up in an unhealthy way. <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. And if I can add to that, especially for a leader who is introducing this concept to himself or to herself or to the organization, I promise you it's going to be uncomfortable initially. Yeah. Each time that you do something for the first time, it's going to sound, oh, this is too much. This is too hectic. This is too heavy. I understand that. But stay with it. Yep. On your third and your fourth trial, it will become easier. It will become Oof. conversational. Even if you miss it the first time, it can rub some conflict. It can produce some conflict. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Just stay with it. Just be intentional about it and go back to it again and refine it as you go. Don't just yeah. give up because the first rub or the first touch was uncomfortable. Wow. Right. So what, what advice would you give to supervisors who uh, need to bring more feedback into the culture? And so what advice would you give to them as they kind of start with just some of their one-on-one -on -one feedback with their team and it's kind of been lacking, how would yes. you walk them through, you know, starting this process, bringing it in? Yes. Okay. The, the first thing that I would say is to communicate the culture you're now bringing in. Mm. Uh, cultivate that. Hey, team, uh, you know, for us to be more effective, for us to be more collaborative and teamwork, I believe this is the route we're going to take. We will need to give each other feedback and what does that look like, right? All right, it's open communication, it's transparency. We don't wanna penalize each other. Yep. You make sure that there is buy-in. People understand this new change. And as you are communicating, you're also gauging how they're receiving it, wow. right? right? And say, you know, be ready for this change. You will see that. And what does it, what will it look like going yeah. forward? That's number one. So you get that buy-in so that when you start doing it, people are not shocked. They understand exactly what they're doing, right? Then the next thing that I would also put in place and that I would advise is actually modeling how to do it. How do I actually give feedback? So you have some different models. The one model that I normally go to is what I call DISC, is you describe the behavior that you want to give feedback on. So let's describe it. Jason when you do this particular thing, number one, so describe that. What is it yep. that you want to say? Then the next thing is express. Mm. Express how it makes you feel, how it is impacting. When you do that, this is how we feel. This is how it's impacting the team. All right. Then you go to the S, what you want to see change. All right this is what I would like you to change, so to speak, right? So you're now asking them that I would like you to change this. Then the C is the consequence, the benefits. Mm. I believe if you do change this, this is how it's going to help our team. This is how it's going to help our relationship. You're going to sell the benefits. So then that's the next thing. So number one, you've identified You've got buy-in on the yep. culture that you're now bringing. 
Number two, you're now teaching them and showing them how to give the feedback, right? And then take it from there. Then the next thing that you want to do is now that you've given each other feedback, how are we going to keep each other honest? The progression around that feedback, the check-ins. Since I have provided feedback on this particular matter on you, how are you doing it? How else can we support you? What else do we need? And what are the implications of doing that? Then at the end of that, you celebrate, number four, the implications of all this. Let's celebrate this. We've given each other feedback. Now we are creating, we are being innovative. We're a better team for it. And it repeats. Wow. I love that. Yes. That is so incredibly helpful. This, I mean, Let's it's- Let's also add another one, Jason. Yeah. And in all this, make sure that you're not just giving feedback on opportunities for growth mm. or challenges. Bring in other elements like what they're doing great. Oh, Jason, when you do A and B and C, wow, you are nailing it. You're killing it. Yep. You are absolutely on the money. Where you can develop is this. So it's how you say it. Wow. Don't just bring in the opportunities for growth, but bring in what they're doing well and yeah. what you want them to keep doing and demonstrate that you understand the skill set, the behavior, be specific about it so that they can go and repeat what they're doing well. Right. And then they can develop what they're not doing well. So be very, very be specific. Wow. Wow. Uh, talk to us about the importance of timing you know, with it? Is it, uh, you know, helpful to, you know, say your team's doing a presentation? Is it helpful to, you know, give the feedback immediately? Is it helpful to wait? Is it, you know, and it could not, it could be something more than just a, a presentation, but, you know, sometimes uh, I've experienced in the past, I'll get feedback from something that happened months ago. You know, what, what's the, what's the, the right time to re uh, remember and be cognizant of when we give that feedback? It's that's such an important question because mm. the timing, the timing cannot be underestimated <laughs> because you can either break somebody or make somebody by the right. timing. All right. Okay. So you play with it. You understand, you've got to understand your context. When somebody is giving feedback in front of a whole room, they're giving feedback with their colleagues. They're going through a presentation. You don't want to do it in that room because that will embarrass them. In my opinion, you want to wait and then do that soon after, maybe to the next day or that afternoon, as mm. soon as possible, though, while it's still fresh in their minds. And again, when you give that kind of feedback, you want to praise what they did well and then bring in the opportunity. All right. Because of the environment, because of the context. Yep. But let's assume it's you and me right now. Okay, and we're working on a project and then I take a call from a customer and then you hear me talk to this customer in a way that is not so professional. Hey, because it's the two of us, please, right there and there, give it to me, right? Give it to me right there and there, all right? Then there's also a place where, yes, it's the two of us and I'm acting in a crazy way, Jason, <laughs> but at that time, you also realize that Mary is emotionally charged right now. So you rather wait mm. because you don't want to evoke anger and yes. frustration. So there's also a place to gather ourselves so that you can go and organize your thoughts. And Mary also needs to organize her thoughts. Then we can engage in a day or two. Wow. And you also explain in the feedback, the reason why I did not give you feedback immediately was because in my observation, our emotions were high. Yes, right. Yeah. Wow. What, what advice would you give to an employee who, when their boss or supervisor gives them feedback, uh, they do it in an angry way or they do it in a, a dismissive or a demeaning way? Uh, what would be your advice be for that, you know, that employee as they're receiving, you know, the feedback, you know, brought to them in, in those kind of unhealthy ways? I would say two things. If, if you're comfortable 
to address it in that meeting, please do so. Mm. That's where your assertiveness comes in. Let them say whatever they've said, right? Don't cut them off. Then at the end of that, once they stop giving you the feedback, just say to them, I, I hear where you're coming from. I differ in this way. Mm. All right. Or exactly the desk model that I gave you. When you give me feedback in such a way that is harsh, aggressive, uh, that is just one directional, you make me feel unappreciated and undervalued. Yep. You've yep. just expressed how it makes you. Wow. What I would like you to do when you give me feedback next time is to give me the opportunity to express myself. You've just done the, 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 the S, right? Yep. What you want to change. And then the consequences. Then you now then, when you do that, when you invite me to also share in the, in the feedback process, you will make me feel valued. I'll become more engaged and that will better suit our team. That's wow. one way you can do it. You're comfortable enough. You've built your confidence already. Yep. Let's assume you don't have time to do that or you don't feel comfortable to address it immediately. Walk yep. away from it without you agreeing to the feedback. Do not agree to that feedback. Just say, I need to process that. Yep. Then go back and process it and then schedule a meeting with your, with your leader or your manager and then say, hey, I had a moment, I had some time to think about the feedback that you gave me. This is what I believe that feedback, these are the results or my feedback towards the feedback you've given me. Yeah. But also give them feedback on their behavior. Absolutely. Oh, boy, that's so good. What do you, what do you suggest uh, timing wise for the employee who they sat in the meeting, they received some feedback and then timing wise, uh, after the fact to acknowledge it, you know, should they, the day after send an email saying, Hey, I, I want you to know, I heard you yesterday. Here's my, my action plan. You know, should, should they send an email? Should they, you know, wait to the next one on one, G give us some of those communication keys that are helpful after, you know, some of that feedback has come to them. Exactly. Um, that's a great one. What I would say is, for those kind of serious feedback sessions that require an email, the leader should start off with that, mm. right? The leader, after the conversation has happened, we've got an action plan, I would go back as a leader, go and initiate that. Mary, this is our meeting, we agreed on this. And then there is the, the employee, the team member responds to that, right? Yes, I agree, this is the action plan yep. immediately immediately a day or two or three days at the maximum that's what i would say once it's still fresh yeah and then let's then say your manager or your leader did not do the email to wrap it up then you can initiate it a day two days three days at the maximum hey jason hey mary thank you very much for a feedback session this is what we agreed on i'm working on this we agreed that we we'll check back in may of 2025 yep. Or whatever date that is yeah that so i do say if you don't receive it from your leader you initiate it immediately mm. to, uh, so one to mm -hmm. yes i love that that is incredible okay so how does it change uh when it's if you're all remote workers does it change at all is there any nuances that we have to remember if we're doing you know feedback conversations on zoom or on the phone you know, any, is anything different or uh, is it pretty much just the same? It's pretty much the same, the consistency of it. Remember people that work remotely, especially if others are working uh, in the office and they're remote, they may feel like they're forgotten. Mm. So please, each time that you interact with them, encourage them to always bring in their voices. And when they bring in their voices, their feedback, act on it as well so that they don't feel like they're being left behind. Yeah. So invite, invite, invite. And there's also that consistency. Make sure that when you do your one-on-one, -on -one, check on them, leave room for that feedback at the end. You know, what do you think? What do we need? What, what can we change? 
How can we improve whatever the feedback needs to be? Make sure that happens. And whatever feedback they give you, incorporate it mm. into the change model so yes. that they don't feel left behind. If you cannot, please explain to them why it cannot be for business reasons or the timing. Make sure that you're involving them. Uh, I, I also believe that for um, online <laughs> feedback, try and encourage people to be on camera. Ah, uh, yeah. Because communication is just not verbal, as you and I know. Right. It's also nonverbal communication. Yep. So that you can see what their body language is saying to you, what it is communicating because you can get a lot of that as well. So if they're comfortable, put it in your culture to be on camera so that you can meet, like what we are doing right now, I can see your body language. Yep. There's a lot that's going on already because we are on camera. So I would say, please in, encourage that. Other than that, everything else that happens in person in terms of receiving and giving feedback should remain true for online yeah. and remote workers. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This has been a master class. I can't thank you enough. Like I'm just thinking through the uh, employees I know, the leaders who I know who this, this will help revolutionize their uh, communication and their leadership. And so I, I just can't thank you enough. Before I let you go, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions, get some of your, your thoughts and resources. We're building a online communication skills library. Uh, and so we're putting all of our guests' favorite resources. And so if, if there's a speaker that you absolutely love, uh, checks all the boxes, uh, fills you up, challenges you, somebody that you, you know, would highly recommend, somebody to watch their YouTube videos or you know, hear them speak at a conference, is there someone that kind of falls into that, that camp for you? Yes. In fact, you know, Jason, w when I was thinking about that question, I was like, why one? Can I not just give you two? Of course. And both, <laughs> and both of them fall in the faith speaking uh, genre. Um, so for your guests, you know, to, to, to just to disclose that they, they, you know, they speak around faith and also depending on whether they like that. So Priscilla Shara is one of my favorite mm. and Lisa Harper. These are dynamic women. I love the way they challenge you. Uh, they, they evoke yes. something inside of you. They're passionate. Their body language. Harper Lisa is excellent. She brings in a lot of humor while you're learning. So yep. these are my go-to people. Uh, um, uh, great, 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 great speakers. Great, great. Speakers. Boy, I love that. Is there, yeah. if, if you're a podcast listener, is there a podcast that's either guilty pleasure or a leadership development that, you know, one or two that you get a lot out of, you love to share with other people? You mean outside yours now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I got, last year I was on a couple of, I was invited to be a guest and, and these are people that I'm now beginning to follow. I really like Joel Goldberg's Rounding the Bases. Mm. Uh, that's a great one. Um, I was recently on Growth is Personal. This is a young gentleman in Canada. His name is Emeka Nwarulo, uh, N-W-A-R-U-L-O-R, -R, mm. the last name. And it's called Growth, in person, uh, Gr Growth is Personal. Those are dynamic. I can give you another list, but I'll, I'm going to be good. I'm just going to give you <laughs> those two for now. Yeah, I love it. And lastly, is there a book? Is there a book that, you think, oh boy, every leader should should read this book. Yes, yes, I'm biased, I'm biased, I'm biased. <laughs> this, is, this is a gentleman who introduced me to customer centricity. Oh, wow. He's late. Uh, the book is called The Customer Blueprint, Building and Leading the 21st Century Organization. Mm. And that's by Doug Leather. Mm. It's a great book. It teaches you customer centricity, but it goes beyond. Remember what we're talking about? Customer centricity. Sorry, customer centricity is just not about the customer. It yep. goes beyond, and it looks at the organization from a systems thinking perspective. So that's a great book for oh. any leader who wants to evolve 
around the customer, but building a whole business engine that supports that. Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, where Where's the best place that we can send our listeners to find out more about you, what you do? Where can they go online? Yes, the best place is LinkedIn. Uh, they would find me under Mary Ritz, PhD. And the second best place is my website, which is AumentaInternational.com. Where did the Almenta come from? Oh, whoa. I was registering the company in South Africa, and it was a pre-registered organization already. Mm. And there were two names left, Almenta International and another. And I chose Almenta International. And guess what? When I went to look the mean, uh, at the meaning to understand what Almenta means, it resonated. It means an inspired woman. Uh, in Latin, that's that. Yeah, yeah. So it just resonated with me. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again. This conversation has been absolutely incredible. You are a, just a brilliant leader, and I I just can't thank you enough for pouring out your wisdom and sharing all of this with our listeners. Thank you again for being on the podcast. Thank you very much, Jason, and to your guests. I really had a great time, and I hope this adds value to you and to your um, followership. Well, thank you for joining us on another episode of the Speak With People podcast. We hope that you were encouraged. We hope that you were inspired and challenged to improve your communication skills. I want to thank you again for being a part of the Speak With People podcast community. Make sure you don't miss out on being a part of the Speak With People Facebook community group. Just head to Facebook, type in Speak With People, scroll down and join our community because every single day we're encouraging each other, we're helping each other to improve our communication skills. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode.